everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Robotham and it's uh, my enormous pleasure uh, this evening to interview a very good friend of mine, uh, the wonderful Canadian crime writer, Linwood Barclay. Um, before I kick it off, I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay respects to elders past and present and emerging. Um, Linwood Barclay, welcome. Uh, and you know, you always bring a new book. It's wonderful. <laughs> It's so nice to see you, Michael. I, once this is our second uh, online chat, I guess, since the pandemic, I want to see you again in person. I hope you're going to get to Toronto before too long. I'd love to see you get to Australia. I, I actually saw on yes. my Facebook feed, came up quite recently, uh, a shot of an event we did in Sydney. I can't even tell you yeah. how many years ago it was. Um, well, I, I can tell you. <laughs> two, that was 2009. We came over. Uh, my wife, Nathan, and I came over and saw you and saw Vivian, and we were, I guess it was 2009, and we were all over Australia and New Zealand, and that was, I think that's when my book, Fear the Worst, came out, and uh, you yeah. guys were great hosts. You were great hosts. That, but to let me talk about that. I mean, you had, um, I mean, I know you'd sort of dabbled in writing, you know, uh, a little bit and had done, done a few novels, but but No Time to Say Goodbye was a complete phenomenon. And I know, I mean, it always feels to me like your first book. I know it wasn't technically your first book, but it feels to me like your first book. Yeah, that was, um, No, uh, no Time for Goodbye was my fifth novel, but it was the first to come out. I don't know if you noticed, but the sun's coming in in a weird way. You know, forgive it, forgive it. I'm, I'm changing every minute with, in glowing in different places. Then, uh, by the way, is, is talking to us from Toronto. So it is a different time. Yes, it's, it's a totally different time zone. Um, yeah, that was uh, No Time for Goodbye was, um, was my, my breakout hit, although it was the fifth novel. But for, for readers in, in the UK and Australia and so forth, it was the first because those first four novels I had done, which were sort of comic fillers, had really only come out mostly in, the, in North America. So everyone's kind of thought No Time was the first. And, but that one did, um, ex did extraordinarily well in, in all over the world, in Germany and, and so forth. And then it was selected by a, a particular book club in the UK and that kind of was like getting shot oh, out of the camera. Phenomenal. So, no, I remember seeing the, being very envious, seeing the figures, you know, 600,000 plus sort of copies in the UK. I mean, it was a brilliant, brilliant premise that, I mean, it was a wonderful book, but I mean, that idea of just subverting that whole idea of, you know, you know, the, instead of the family waking up and finding the child gone to have the child wake up and discover the family gone was just yeah. a brilliant sort of idea. Well, you know, it's kind of like lightning striking, you know, you just wait for these, you know, if you, I find that if you, right now I'm sort of deciding, what am I going to write this fall? And I don't really know yet. And when you sit down and think, what's a great idea, nothing comes, you just have to kind of clear your head and, and wait for something that's floating out there in the ether to just sort of hit you, I think. You yeah, know. it's funny. I'm, I'm a bit like you by the sounds of it. I mean, people imagine that we have a drawer full of ideas and all we have to do is simply finish one book and open the drawer and pluck another one out because that they're just... Yeah. All... I know. I, I was did an event with Dean Rankin one time and Ian said he has all these little slips of paper where he writes down ideas. And I said to him on stage, I said, could I have a couple? Yeah. You know, just, just, you know, I don't need a lot, just a few little sheets of paper. Oh, I'm just a bit mind, you know, that question we always get, where do your ideas come from? And I know, yeah. I mean, Ian's got a brilliant answer. Neil Gaiman's got a brilliant answer. He always tells people that there's this little shop in Brighton down this alleyway. And if you go down there and knock on the door <laughs> yes. a certain way, yes. they let you in and it's full of ideas and you just choose one. And, um, yeah. and I remember Ian once told an audience that when he got his publishing deal, they gave him this website address and a password and he could log in and choose which idea he wanted and someone <laughs> and someone came up to him afterwards and offered him 50 quid for the website address and password you know <laughs> i would say i would say i go to ideas are us you know <laughs> that's a good that's a good that's they got you can you buy them by the pound you just load them up and you just haul them out to the station way but i mean this one talking about ideas i mean look both ways your new one um your new one has got just such a clever idea at the heart of it. I mean, was that, tell us about how, I mean, first of all, tell us, pitch, give us a, a quick pitch of the book and then tell us where that sure. idea Sure. Yeah, and, and what's delightful in a way too is that look both ways, the only place where it's currently out is Australia and New Zealand. It's come out there before anywhere else. It's not coming out uh, in anywhere else really until October, November. So you guys, you got it first. 
And it's a bit of a departure for me in that it's not a kind of conventional, or if, or if my other ones are conventional, but it's not a, a typical thriller that I usually do. It's more kind of what I would call a Michael Crichton kind of a thriller. I describe it as think Jurassic Park, but instead of dinosaurs, it's self-driving cars. That's and it's exactly a, my, that, that was exactly my thought. I just sort of said, yep. you have done for self-driving cars what Michael Crichton did for dinosaurs. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's an it's an island it's an island community, and a big car company that makes these self driving cars comes in and says the best way to tell, test self driving cars is if every car on the road is one because they have this kind of hive mind. They all communicate with each other. Nobody's ever going to have an accident at an intersection, so everyone agrees for the period of a month to surrender their regular cars and get take them to the mainland, and everybody gets one of these cars for a month, and it all looks just wonderful until the big media day when a virus gets introduced into the system and all the cars essentially become homicidal. It's like being on an island with a thousand Christines is basically what this book is about. And it was just so much fun to write. I wrote it, I must have written it at least three years ago and my publishers loved it, but because it was so different than what I typically do, they were like, what are we going to do with this? Or when are we going to bring it out and so forth? So, but at least it's uh, now, it's fine. It's finally out. It's, I mean, because your stuff is normally that sort of psychological, domestic noir. I mean, very much yeah. the ordinary person thrust into the spotlight by an extraordinary event. Whereas That's this pretty high concept. Yeah. This, this is much higher concept. Yeah, it's, this is a very different, it, it's, you know, and it has kind of elements of tech and it's, I don't know if it's borderline sci-fi or not. But it's uh, but it is and it's a it's a pure action thriller I think from from the get go, and so I hope people will like it. You know, it's a little different, but I just I just and you know the other thing that means a lot to me is that although I'm not sure in the edition that you have whether on the title page there's that little drawing of a Cadillac. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now I didn't I don't I think they're going to try to use it more in a larger in a in they're going to use it larger in some of the other editions. But my, I grew up surrounded with car imagery. And that little tiny drawing, which I have this big frame, is, a, is an airbrushed illustration by my father. And my father was a commercial artist who worked in advertising. And back in the 1950s and the early 60s, all the car ads were illustrations and not photography. And he drew those cars. So um, I grew up surrounded with, with you know, car imagery and model cars. And my dad had his big you know, uh, art table, art studio, you know, working on these beautiful drawings. So it was kind of it, part of my DNA, I think. So it's, it's one of the reasons why I want I mean, to. I've it. seen some of those. I mean, I've been, I've visited you and I've seen some of those drawings that your father did and they are beautiful. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I remember those magazines and remember seeing those. I mean, they're, they're slightly stylistic, aren't they, compared to the real cars? Well, well by stylistic, they lie. If that's what you're saying, I mean, because <laughs> I can remember looking. My dad would make, would take a photograph of a beautiful '50s era car, say a, say a dead on profile, and he would blow this thing up about this big, and then he on his art table, and then he would take like a little exacto knife, and where the where the rear window hit the trunk, he would cut down through the fender, and then he would pull the picture apart and fill in more fender so that the car looked longer and lower than what it really was. He used to say that, that, that photography killed illustration in the 60s because the cars started looking better and they didn't need the help. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you obviously, I mean, and I, and I want to talk about the whole self-driving phenomenon, but you personally, I, I want to talk to you quickly about your history with cars because you, you're a great lover of cars. I mean, you- Oh, I love cars, yeah. You know, and, 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 and tell me where that began. Though. Where did that love of cars, was it watching your father draw these pictures or? I, I think it was, I mean, I, they tell me, I don't almost actually remember this, but they tell me when I was two years old, my parents could stand me on the sidewalk and as every car went by, they could show me off for the neighbors. As every car went by, I could say, that's a Buick. That's a Chevy. That's a Ford. I knew them all. I could identify all the little difference in the grill and so forth. So I could spot them all. And, and my dad would buy these little model cars about this long that sometimes he actually used as kind of reference, but you know, he'd collect a lot of them and I'd play with them. And so I just, and we would go to car shows together as I was growing up and and sort of by default in a sort of tragic way, but my when I got my license at the age of 16, 
by default, I got this magnificent um, Dodge Charger, like the one the bad guys drove in Bullet, because my dad had finally bought a really cool car when I was 15 years old, and it was Dodge just Dodge Charger. And when I was 16, he became ill with lung cancer, couldn't drive, and then ultimately died within that year. My mom didn't drive. And this, I was the family, I was suddenly the family driver. And I was taking my mom everywhere. But when I, you know, when I didn't have to run an errand with my mom, I was just booting it around in this Dodge Charger looking awfully cool. So I just always, I mean, I just always loved them. Just loved loved them. Uh, which brings us to this point, because, um, I mean, it's funny, I've, I've, we've literally in the last two weeks just bought an electric car. Oh, yeah. It was one of those cars that's got everything from lane assist to blind spot cameras to you know automatic this and literally if you take your hands off the wheel it sends you a warning that your hands are not on the steering wheel i mean yeah and it's it's moving towards you know and i know you and i know we're, i will talk about this so i did the self-driving car phenomenon that's coming um but more and more seems to be taken out of the driver's hands and I, I get the impression that you're not looking forward to this this future <laughs> i i I really not. It's just like we're all going to have our own, you know, personal taxi, but there won't be a guy driving it who tells you about the screenplay he's working on. And uh, so I'm not, I, I like the experience of driving. I like the thrill of driving. I like having that kind of control. The idea of getting in a vehicle and going on a two or three hour drive and just being able to sit there and do nothing. I think it's how, inc it's how incredibly boring that will be to not in any way be involved with the experience. So I'm not, I'm hoping that I will, you know, pop my clog before everybody has to have one. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just sort of thinking though, I mean, I'm not in any way aiming to get in the cockpit of a plane. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, there long, are. Journeys. long journeys and let someone else fly that sucker. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, I, I, and if I'm on a train, I don't have to go up front. I'm okay there, but just driving, there's something about that, that it's a very, it's a kind for me it's a kind of emotional experience that sort of with the melding of of your physical body with the vehicle and how it doesn't do anything unless you tell it and and it's this extension of yourself well it's, and, it, i mean it's yeah. a great symbol and I, i'm sure you felt that at 16 and 7 the great symbol of freedom isn't it i mean to have, i mean back in the day you know when you know it was also it was everything about the whole sexual liberation. If you had a car, then you also had, you know, a, you know, <laughs> you had a sin, right. so to speak, you know. Um, That's right. Not as uh, easy in the tiny little vehicles today, though. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting that, you know, because you feature the Montrose family in this story, you know, where you obviously have this island, there's only, um, and, uh, you know, you have this island where everyone's surrendered their cars and they all have these automated self driving cars. Um, but it's interesting that the Montrose family, who are the feature family in the whole thing, there are two children. Uh, one of the daughter is wants to learn to drive, but the mother, because her father died in a car accident, the mother is yeah. reluctant to let the daughter get the driving license. But you very much play on that whole idea of it's a rite of passage. It's a, it's something yeah. you know that all and maybe we're going to lose that with self-driving cars. Teenagers won't get to, to experience that that ride of passage. That's right. Yeah, because I, I, you know, the the main, this, as you say, this family, the mother, she's there, her husband, the kid's father fell asleep at the wheel. Well, and the car crashed and he died. And that's, that won't happen with a self-driving vehicle or shouldn't. And so she's, you know, here's this daughter who's on the cusp of getting a license. She figures, well, just wait, don't even do it because soon you won't need it. And, and of course, she's not interested in that notion at all. And of course, her younger brother, his buddies have figured out how to sort of overrule the commands in the car that they're supposedly only supposed to respond to the father's command. And they're off joyriding in this thing, telling it where to go and what to do, having just a wonderful time. So he's, her younger brother thinks it's just about the coolest thing that ever happened. It's interesting. Now, you've obviously in the, I'm assuming in the research for this, I mean, you know, we've been getting stories, you know, for, for, uh, quite a number of years now about that this this, this self-driving phenomenon that's coming but then also periodically you know tragedies where suddenly you know I mean we're asking a vehicle potentially to recognize the difference of you know to miss the dog that runs out in front of the road but not hit the child that's walking beside the road I mean all those yeah. potential I mean you can 
literally millions of possible decisions and scenarios that you're asking a computer to actually and i know yeah. computers can think faster than we can but can they morally make those decisions? exactly that's that's and that's really a good point too that sort of moral decision it's like there's no way out of this accident but i can do less harm if i go here well can the car figure that out yeah. and and whereas individuals can make that kind of a moral decision you know if they're thinking quickly enough so yeah that's for sure it's it's like it was just it was so much fun to do this book. It Tell really me. Was. And of course, and I have to say just very quickly that there is one car left on the island that is not a self-driving vehicle. And it looks uh, remarkably like the one that's in the little illustration. This is the, the 1959 page. Cadillac. The 1959 Cadillac, which is so big, it kind of occupies two time zones. And uh it's, uh, it's maybe was rather an unlikely hero in this story, but uh, sorry, you were going to ask something. No, no. I mean, I like the idea that you have, you know, obviously there's one vehicle that hasn't gone completely rogue, you know, and, <laughs> and, and the vehicle you've chosen is basically a tank on wheels. <laughs> oh, so much, so much. Thank you very, oh, very much so. But uh, yeah, it was just, it was a real blast. I now, mean, listen, you, I, you know, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just going to say, you've got, Oops. <laughs> you, you said it on Garrett Island. Is that a, I mean, did you have a, an island in mind when you, I mean, it's about 10,000 people that this sort of fictional island you've set it on? I imagined it being a place like Martha's Vineyard okay. um, off the coast of, you know, in Massachusetts, uh, off, the, uh, off the coast. Think of, you know what, think of Amity Island in Jaws. It's yeah. basically a place like that. So it's big enough that it's got a community, it's got a town, it's got a big shopping, you know, it's got a shopping center, but it still is removed from the mainland without a bridge. You know, there's, it takes a ferry to get to it. And I like the idea, I, I have visions and maybe I'm wrong, because I, I, I realized as a writer that you had a lot of fun writing this, because you could tell when, you, when I was reading it that you had a lot of fun writing it. But I just have visions of you walking around thinking to yourself all the time, okay, you know, um, I mean, because, you know, initially you're right, there's this issue about, you know, if you have these cars running around, you know, homicidal cars, well, cars can't take stairs, you know, it's a bit like the Daleks in the Doctor Who, you think, you know, yeah. why didn't the Doctor just escape the Daleks? For <laughs> they go the upstairs. <laughs> yeah. But... It's interesting the way you you've got around that problem with again that hive mind that the cars have that they can work together to overcome those problems. Yeah, there's without giving things away. There's a, a scene in the, my favorite part of the book. I think is there's a scene in a law in a big two story mall, two level mall with escalators, and they the the and the cars have managed to run wild through here. And people figure that if they can get to the lower level, they'll be fine. But this hive mind uh, works not to their advantage. Yeah, no, it's very, no, it's beautifully done. It's interesting. In, in a previous novel of yours, Elevator Pitch, I mean, where you had basically elevators, you know, I mean, there are, I can't remember how many tens of thousands of, of elevators there, all, uh, there are in New York, for example, but the whole thing, most of them are run by computers and that if someone could get control of those computers, they could, they could, you know, send these elevators plunging to the, yes. to the basement, you know, and killing, you know, I mean, and I know there are people that, you know, would have read that book that refused to step into an elevator again, but, you know, I, you know, um, I think you're doing this for self-driving cars, actually. I think. <laughs> it's, well, you know, it, you do wonder, I mean, I know when I wrote Elevator Pitch by a guy who was sabotaging elevators throughout Manhattan, I like to say I did that really as a public service to get people to take the stairs and get in shape. <laughs> that was my entire motivation in that book you know yeah whereas this one this one i can basically see that you know um you know you you i wouldn't invest in shares and self-driving cars if i if i read this book <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i don't think this book will be enough to stop the trend you know it's it's i don't i can't i don't give myself as much credit for to have that kind of power but uh but i want to ask you something i want to talk to you about because um I understand from, from what the folks at Booktopia said that both of our, uh, this book and your latest uh, Lying Beside You are both sort of tied into a Father's Day promo. And, I, and my wife, Nitha, wanted me to tell you how much she loved 
lying beside you. I got hold of it first and then she read it. And, uh, and the whole time she was going through it, she was just, it takes a lot to get her to just stop looking at her phone, you know? <laughs> and, but that book did, and I say too, what a fantastic title. It was just the way that title works and the, the, the different levels that it's on was just, it's just, it's a really wonderful book. And I know it's, it's a continuation of earlier storyline and, and, but it was just, it's like all of your books. Um, you make me care about these deeply flawed characters so much and, yeah. and, uh, and how, like I've always said, I think I, I think I said this on a book quote one time, but that, I'm not so much, I, I mean, I'm scared for your characters, but mostly my heart just aches for them. That yeah. they so, they're so kind of often well-intentioned, but it just doesn't work out. You know, it's funny, it was, it, that's one of the nicest blurbs actually or in quotes I've ever had for, and I, and I often quote that back to people, um, that line of yours. You know, it's funny, I don't, I'm not a believer in three word slogans, um, mainly because they're used too often by politicians for the wrong reasons. Um, but the three words that my mantra that I live by pretty much in all my writing is make them care, you know, yeah. and, um, and that is about trying to create characters. You know, it's terrible, isn't it? I mean, I mean, you do the same so much so often in, in, in your books that you create characters that the reader will hopefully fall in love with as much as you, the writer, has fallen in love with them. And then you do terrible things to them. <laughs> <laughs> put, them in, yes. put them in great, sure. in great danger. <laughs> terrible terrible things i mean you know your your main character in that book you know i mean and because i i read it when i first got it a few months ago so i can't remember the character's names oh, but cyrus her, haven is the is cyrus and cyrus haven and evie cormac yeah so cyrus cyrus is cyrus has the most patience of just about any character i have ever read in any book and when anybody else would have given up on somebody Cyrus doesn't and I think that's one of the the really great strengths about his character and why you like him so much is that when any of the rest of us would think you know what I, I just can't deal anymore he's he doesn't he stays and and, and to, to, to deal with a situation and I think that's what makes him such a, a, a memorable character yeah I think he's um I mean, I, I think the, the reason that those two characters work, Cyrus has got that tragic backstory of having seen his his parents and twin sisters um, killed when he was only 13. And Evie Cormack, the other narrator, is obviously suffered enormous sort of abuse. And, yeah. and, uh, and they're both broken, but both of them sort of realise that each of them is damaged and that maybe together they can save each other. There's sort of a, a bond there. Um, you know, but it's interesting. I mean, how much when you're writing, I don't know about you, but I know with my previous series, the Joe Lachlan series, and also the Cyrus Haven series, I'm writing people that I think are brave, certainly braver than I am, because I'm a complete coward, you know. Um, <laughs> and, they're, and they're, you know, I always joke that, you know, I'm my mother's son. My mother once screamed so loudly in a cinema, they stopped the film and turned the lights up, you know. Um, and I am, I am that person. Um, but, you know, they're cleverer than I, they're braver than I am, they're cleverer than I am. And there's a degree, I think, of wish fulfillment in, in so many of the characters that I write. How about you? Do you, are there certain characters you relate to and you think, you know? Well, I think in a lot of them, again, we talked about this earlier about how, you know, I, I tend to write about ordinary people who get caught up in extraordinary circumstances and uh, people who are really in no way equipped to deal with the danger or the evil that they're facing and that's certainly me you know because that would be if i was up against the kind of things that some of my characters are like i would just i would certainly cut and run and i'd be gone and but i think what what you try to do in a thriller is you have to make the stakes so high that even if you're a coward you can't cut and run mm. you you have to face the situation and and so that's kind of i think maybe that's where i i sort of try to get my own head into this into the character is that how bad would it have to get before i could screw up the courage and, and deal with it yeah i know you it's know? interesting i think i know with the joe lachlan character his his the great love of his life julianne would often say to him 
you know, because he was a man with a great, he was a character with a great sense of humanity that would, you know, get himself into great trouble because he was trying to help people. But she would say, why can't you be the person that runs away yelling for help? <laughs> Why do you have to be the person that charges into the burning building trying to help? You know, and yeah. it's, that, it's that, and I think that's the mindset. Although I, I agree with, with what you say that, yeah, if you create a situation where there is no choice, you know, yeah. you know, there's no, particularly if someone that you love is in great danger, you know. Um, I, I want to ask, are we going to, are you continuing on with Cyrus? Are we going to go back to Joe? Are we doing something altogether new? I'm going to, I'm writing another Cyrus uh, and Evie book now. Um, and, and I don't know about Joe because the TV series, um, the Joe Locke and TV series um, premieres in the UK at the end of this month. Um, mm -hmm. World Productions who did uh, Blind of Duty and The Bodyguard and, oh, and nice. have made, made it. And they're working on a second series now. So I may be tempted, uh, you know, to bring Joe back in a future book, just, It'll have been by about six or seven years since I, I wrote him. If I do bring yeah. him, yeah. Um, but I mean, it's that's interesting because you've never done. Oh no, it's not quite true. You've done a trilogy, but I mean, you normally stick to standalones, don't you? Well, when I started out, the uh, the first four novels were a series. They were sort of comic, a comic thriller about the same about the same character named Zach Walker. And then once we got to, and then after that, yeah, it was pretty much standalones. Although I did do I did do a sequel seven years later to No Time for Goodbye, a novel called No Safe House. Oh, I remember that. Um, yeah, and then I but but you're right. I did do the I the Promise False trilogy, which was uh, Broken Promise, Far from True, and the Twenty Three, and then I did a kind of follow up book called Oh, um, uh, it'll come to me, Parting Shot. Uh, but it's terrible when you start forgetting the names of your books. Oh God, and I can't remember the character names. You know. And, uh, and, but since then, everything I've done in the last few years have all been standalones. And I don't see, I don't, I, I think that's the way it's going to continue, at least for now. I mean, I could have come back to the character who's in elevator pitch, but I don't feel any strong compunction to do so. And I think mean, it's, and it's, you know, that it's that flip side, you know, like I, I love another Cyrus and Evie book because I love those characters but you can't kill them off yeah. you know and so when you're doing a series you you have some limitations but you also have these people that readers love and are happy to meet again when you do a standalone you just do whatever the hell you want with these people and yeah, I guess uh, from my point of view i find standalone's a little harder because you're creating every character in you you're recreating their worlds and their backstory and the whole which is exciting i used to like you know my previous career was you know we both were journalists for many years we've got very similar career paths but I then became a ghostwriter for about a decade yeah. and in ghostwriting and writing autobiographies for famous people I was looking at the world through their eyes and it was completely you know a new project each time um, and I find with going back to a series at least you know your characters you don't have to re-establish who they are in your own mind you already know so much about them they are like old friends yep so I find it easier to get into a series book, whereas when I start writing a standalone, it takes me a lot longer. Just that first third of the book takes so much longer to... to... I, I totally get that. Even when I did those first four sort of funnier thrillers, they, you know, it was like putting on, like certainly by book three or four, it was like, you know, getting into old slippers. Like, I know these people, I know how they're going to act, I know how they're going to react to each other. I know where they live. I know all that stuff. I just have to figure out what the hell to do to them this time. Yeah. And uh, so that's, it's, you know, maybe someday I'll get back into that. But I, I think to do a series, you, I need, you really need a character that is in some way is unique. You know, what yeah, can you do? I, what can you do that's different? Yeah. And this is why I guess, and I'm not a great lover of police procedurals, but if you have a detective character or a private detective character, then it's someone that you can just see will keep getting themselves into, into these situations where so many of your books, they are based on the ordinary man or woman. Yeah. Yes. And, and it's, it's, you know, there's only so many potential. I mean, I know, you know, you know, with murder, she wrote that Angela Lansbury kept finding a body every time she pruned her roses, but in real life, you know, that's not, what? Yeah, I know. I know. If your if your main character, you know, is a golf pro, 
it's hard to get him into a murder in every book. You know? Yes. Yeah. I think Je I I think Jessica Fletcher killed half those people. <laughs> yes. Kept a career going anyway. Kept a career going. Look, I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions here. I mean, I love these sort of stories, but I, do you have a work worst book signing story or a most <laughs> most humiliating moment as a writer story? <clears throat> I have so many, but let me see if I can. I'll start, but if you, you go. You go, you go, and I'm going to think about the best one I have, but you go first. Well, my, my worst book signing story, and this dates way, way back, was when I was a very, very young journalist. I was sent off to interview Colin McCulloch, who'd written The Thornbirds, who was a huge sort of international star. And, and, uh, and I interviewed her, I would have only been about 19 or 20, and I had a copy of The Thornbirds, and um, I was really nervous about meeting her. But at the very end of the interview, she asked me whether I wanted her to sign the book. And, and I didn't want to take up any more of the time. So I said no. And, <laughs> and I know now as a writer, what a horrible, horrible thing that was to say. to say. But at the time, I just thought I was being like polite. And, and, yeah, yeah. and the look on her face said everything and you couldn't take it back you couldn't go oh well, go on then <laughs> i mean yeah i mean that's my most in terms of you know book signing oh like. man <laughs> no i i when i had a i did a couple of humor books that unrelated to crime fiction that were came out in canada and i remember when uh, one of them came out you know it's like how it is you, you start going into bookstores to see if anybody has it and if they have it is it at the front of the store or is it buried in the stacks and is it you know is it is it sitting like this on the shelf or is it sitting like this on the shelf? You know, so I go in and and it's, it was a humor book. And not only do they have it well displayed in the humor section, you know, like face out, and there's like a half a dozen copies. There's a little card slipped under it, one of those like employee recommendation cards, and it said read and recommended by Jamie. I thought, well, isn't that nice? So I go to the front of the store, and there's this kid working the cash, and he's got a hi, my name is Jamie, but. I said, Jamie, I see you read and recommended my book. Would you like me to sign copies? And Jamie is quite astonished by this because, and I, you know, I attribute this to him not meeting massive celebrities all the time. <laughs> and, and so I lead him back. We go back to the humor section. We go around the corner. And as soon as he sees it, it all comes back. And he goes, oh, yeah, right. He says, somebody moved this. And he took it out from under my book. <laughs> and, he, and he shoved it under a humor book by Dave Barry that it was sitting next to. Uh -oh. And then he said, and then he said, well, you sign it if you want. And then he was gone back <laughs> to the cash. Now, oh. I, I like to tell people who are starting out in this business that writing affords you the opportunity to be humiliated in ways that you did not know existed. Yeah. And that's just one, you know, and every time I, I love getting together with, I love getting together with folks like you and other writers, because we all have these kinds of stories and we just love telling them. There's, um, there's actually was an amazing book written a few years ago, uh, quite a few years ago now called Mortification. And it's actually interviews with writers and poets about their most humiliating moment. And, uh, you know, well, it, my, favorite, my favorite is, uh, is a, the poet Simon Armitage tells a story about walking along the road. I think this at least wasn't public humiliation, but he walked along the road and he saw a charity shop up ahead and there was a little dump bin outside with, you know, secondhand books. And he noticed that his little hardback book of poetry was in there. And so his heart sank a little bit. And then as he got closer, he saw a sign by the author sticker on the front and his heart sank a little bit more. And so he got there and he picked it up and he opened it up and there in his handwriting, it said to mum and dad, yeah, and uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh that's i love that that's just well you know one of the best ones i ever heard is not mine it's, it's adrian mcginty you know who wrote the chain i love adrian yeah no he's a, he's a yes. of mine. Yeah. he's got a great one about doing an event where they've set up you know metal folding chairs for like 50 people and only five show up so he starts doing his event for the five and the janitor figures well i guess i'll fold these other ones up now and so all he's doing is reading it's whack Black, putting all the chairs together away i just thought that's a, that's oh i love that one yeah no it's amazing limit it is always uh an enormous pleasure to talk to you i oh, know yeah. we talk on uh, for hours um i do want to recommend to everyone to pick up look both ways um it's such a fun read it is and but with a warning that you know any thoughts you had of uh 
of uh, getting a self-driving car in the future will probably disappear completely having read this book. Um, <laughs> it is available uh, as part of a Booktopia special, as is lying uh, beside you, you know, my latest yes, one. Yes, um, which is so good. Yeah, and Father's Day is coming up. I mean, uh, I, there's a gift for Dad. Um, always a pleasure, Linwood. Uh, give my love to Nisa and, um, right. and the rest of the family, and we will have to get together again very soon. We will. Please say hi to Vivian for me, and it's uh, it's really good to see you. It's always good to, to spend some time with you, even if it's virtually. Okay. Sounds great. Limo Barclay, thank you very much.